I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Uh, Crystal Hankinson uh, currently serves as the program coordinator for the Child and Adolescent Trauma Treatment and Training Institute, which is part of the University of Kentucky Center on Trauma and Children. In this role, she manages the clinical activities and provides trauma-focused treatment and assessment services to children and families at CADI. Uh, she is the licensed marriage and family therapist who also serves as a training specialist for the Center on Trauma and Children. Ms. Hankinson earned her master's degree in clinical counseling, uh, marriage and family therapy from LaSalle University. She has over 17 years of experience working in collaboration with individuals, children, and family families. Uh, educating and raising awareness about the perv pervasiveness of trauma and empowering individuals to learn about trauma-focused treatment and intervention uh, is her passion. So thank you and everyone welcome Crystal Hankinson. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Um, I am thrilled to be here with you all now. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So these are the learning objectives for today's time. Um, that we have together. Really, I wanna introduce you to the adverse childhood experiences, if you haven't already heard about them, um, and toxic stress. I'll talk a little bit about brain development. I can really geek out on the brain development stuff, but I know that that's not everybody else's cup of tea. So I'll keep that session brief, that section brief. Um, we're gonna talk about how, impact, um, how trauma impacts the whole individual. Um, throughout their life cycle. And then we're gonna look through, um, look at substance misuse disorder through a trauma-formed lens. And we're gonna talk a bit about language too and the importance of language. Um, and then I wanna share with you guys a trauma-informed care approach and talk with you guys about some resources that are available. So if we were in person, <clears throat> this would be true, even though we're on telehealth. So if you had a broken ankle, I could come up to you and I could be like, hey, I see that your foot's in a cast. Um, let me grab you a chair, feel free to prop it up. Here's some water. Um, do you need anything? Is there anything that I can do to help? But when we've been hurt internally and we've been traumatized, I can't always look out into an audience and tell if they're being affected. So I want everybody to feel safe. I have no idea what everyone's trauma history may be today. I'm gonna to do my best to try not to trigger you, but I do wanna let you know that there are some things we're gonna to discuss today that could be triggering. Um, and so feel free, I can't even see you, right? Cause we're doing telehealth. So feel free to get up, to walk around, to do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself um, because that's what's most important is your psychological safety. The other thing is I'm gonna stay for a little bit after the presentation. Sometimes people would like to ask me questions in private. Um, so I'll stay to do that or you're welcome to email me or call me and all those things will be available at the end. Um, most importantly, I want you to know you're not alone. Um, that there are multiple and plenty um, trauma survivors out there that are happy and healthy and doing well. So we are here with you. So when we think about trauma, what is it that we think is traumatic? Um, it's the experience um, of exposure to actual threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violation. But there are some ways in which we can experience that. There's direct exposure, meaning that it happened to us. Um, there's bystander or witnessing of um, a traumatic event. So this would be like community violence. Um, if you watched um, domestic violence, um, but this doesn't include the media. Learning that a loved one was exposed um, is a form of kind of that vicarious um, trauma that we can experience. And then the repeated extreme indirect exposure, that tends to happen to us if we are in the healing profession. So many of you that are here with us today will know exactly what I'm talking about. First responders, physicians, nurses, peer support specialists, therapists, um, teachers, we can all hear repeated um, traumatic events and details through our jobs. So this list certainly isn't exhaustive by any means, um, but these are some types of things that can happen um, that we would consider traumatic, right? That that would be a traumatic experience for you. And I wanna highlight some of them because I feel like it's so very important. Um, you know, domestic violence, um, traumatic loss or separation, 
whether that be for a child or the elderly. Um, obviously, we know that those are traumatic events, right? But not everybody takes into consideration medical procedures. So certainly our veterans that return home um, from being um, not stateside, you know, if they've had an um, amputation happen, then obviously that can be very traumatic for them. But it can be equally traumatic for somebody, let's say if they've gone through testicular cancer or breast cancer, when there is a physical change to your body or a sudden heart attack that required medical intervention um, and procedures. Those are all things that can be very traumatic for individuals. Um, I really want to point out historical trauma and racial trauma. This is kind of a really hot topic right now in research for trauma. And so, um, especially given 2020 and all that that brought to light for us, um, it's really important to talk about the fact that there is a lot of racism still existing in the United States. And that historical trauma, um, you know, can be things like segregation, um, women's rights and women's movement, um, Native Americans, um, that were segregated as well. So I want you to know that trauma can actually change our DNA. Trauma can actually change the alleles on our DNA. And so we want to do everything that we can to either mitigate it or to buffer against it so that it's not happening. So what about neglect? I think that that one gets left out sometimes. Um, people may not think that that is as serious as um, sexual abuse or physical abuse, but in fact, it's extraordinarily important, especially if it's a child or somebody who is dependent on another adult for caregiving. So I'm thinking of individuals that may be medically fragile um, or our elderly population. So physical and environmental neglect is very real, um, a lack of appropriate supervision, um, you know, leaving um, individuals with inappropriate caregivers, um, substance misuse can absolutely impact um, environmental and physical neglect. Um, medical, if they don't make it to the appointments that they need to, educational, if they're not allowed to attend school, um, and all of these can actually interfere with brain development and the child's ability to recover, but it also opens the door for other traumatic events. So stress is on a continuum, right? We have normal stress, moderate stress, traumatic stress. I think of normal stress like your presenter today, wanted to make sure that I could give you guys everything that I had. But I also, because it's such a deep, heavy topic, you'll hear me joke occasionally. Now, because we're not together, I don't know if you're laughing or not. So in my mind, I just play that soundtrack of you guys ch chuckling and cracking up at my jokes, right? But that's what normal stress is, right? When we're getting ready for a presentation, um, when we're getting ready to take a large exam or something. Moderate stress is different. It's painful, but if we have protective factors, we'll get through it. So I'm thinking like a divorce, um, a natural disaster. Traumatic stress is very different. This is extreme. This is what we consider toxic stress. And so the way that I typically explain this is um, normal stress is absolutely normal. We all go through it. Moderate stress is when your brother decides um, when you're age five and he's 15 to let you watch Nightmare on Elm Street. True story, guys. True story. And he covers your eyes and ears when all the sexual content comes up. But like when Johnny Depp gets dragged through the mattress and all the blood comes out, you see all of that. But as the good sister you are at five years old, you promise you will not tell your parents and you don't. But when you wake up screaming at 3 a.m. in the morning that Freddy Krueger is coming to get you, they kind of figure it out, right? So mom comes in, she sprays monster be gone under the bed. We're all good. Traumatic stress is for those children where Freddy Krueger literally walks through the door every evening and you don't know if you're going to get the slice and dice Freddy or if you're going to get a funny Freddy versus Jason type of Freddy. Um, so absolutely for children especially, but also for adults, traumatic events can overwhelm our sense and ability to cope, right? It can elicit feelings of terror, powerlessness, out of control psychological arousal. So I want you guys to kind of keep that in mind as we're talking about traumatic stress. This can happen to children, but also adults. Um, so there's three ways that we categorize trauma. Acute, that's a single one-time event. Um, 
chronic, that's repeated and cumulative, and then complex, that's enduring. And there's really a betrayal of trust that occurs. Um, so here's the interesting thing about trauma. Two individuals could go through the exact same traumatic event and have very different responses. So it doesn't matter what the trauma is per se, it's the person's um, experience of that and how that affects them psychologically and physically. Complex trauma is huge. And so I wanna take a minute just to really focus on this and highlight it. Complex trauma refers to the exposure of multiple traumatic events that happen from an early age and they can continue throughout the life cycle. Um, but it's immediate long-term effects really impact development in children. And so complex trauma is actually a, an umbrella. It goes above and beyond post-traumatic stress disorders and actually um, will affect the way that children interact with the world, their attachment styles, um, their emotion regulation, the way that they view the world, how they're able to trust individuals. I mean, the list just goes on and on. Complex trauma is one of the ones that when we see people who are older um, and we have these horrible names for them, right? Um, drama mama, one French fry short of a happy meal. Um, the elevator's not going all the way up. Like all these really horrific terms for them. And they might be the person that's aggressive verbally, they're cursing at you, or they may even be physical where they're spitting. But I wanna let you know that that is an adult that learned as an early child that if they act aggressive, then they won't get hurt. So when you see that behavior, just remember that somewhere in that individual, there is a small child going, stop, don't come any closer, I can't risk being hurt again. Um, these are the different types of traumatic stress reactions that we see. They're part of post-traumatic stress disorder criterion. Um, and so uh, dissociation is also part of that. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But there's intrusion, um, hyperarousal reactivity, negative alteration in cognition and mood, and avoidance. So I've broken these down a little bit, but here's what I'd like to talk about as you read these slides yourself, right? Because I'm not going to read them for you. When we talk about intrusive symptoms, hyperarousal and reactivity, negative cognition and um, mood, and also um, uh, dissociation, when we're looking at all five of those clusters of post-traumatic stress disorder, if you don't do a really good job of assessing trauma history and trauma experience, people can be misdiagnosed with all sorts of things. Attention deficit disorder, um, bipolar disorder, all of the disorders that have an emotion regulation component can actually be traumatic stress and not any of those other disorders. So we really wanna kind of take a look and see if any of these things are going on. Is it really truly a diagnosis of ADHD or bipolar? Or is it that this person has grown up and not received any intervention for traumatic stress symptoms? Um, meaning that they've got complex trauma. And so none of that has been processed or healed. So they look like they've got emotion dysregulation that's, um, applicable and can be categorized in other disorders. And um, everyone, I'm happy to share a handout with you guys. I think that John has put one on the website or we'll be sending one out. I'm not sure, but if you want it, you can always get it from me. I'm happy to share that with you. Dissociation is really important too. I want to talk with you guys about that. Um, the people who have been dissociating for decades and no one knows about it, you may not notice it. Um, some of us in the field um, explain it as that glazed overlook in the eyes, like they're staring off into space or they're distant. Other times you'll, you'll definitely notice it. Um, veterans that are coming home and they may hear a loud noise and you'll see them crouch down under a desk because it sounds like it's incoming bomb. So dissociation really is where we separate from our body. I believe strongly that substance misuse disorder has a lot to do to play in this role too with dissociation, because when we take substances, we don't have to access our emotions anymore, right? We can cut those off. So it is in a way a, a type of dissociation. We just wanna get away from the pain that we're feeling and the thoughts that we're having. So what increases the risk of post-traumatic stress disorder? There's definitely specific event factors. Um, the female gender 
tend to have PTSD, um, but that's just the ones that seek treatment, right? We do know that a lot of males or individuals who identify as males don't always necessarily seek treatment to even be diagnosed. Previous um, trauma exposure, any type of pre-existing disorders, um, if there was some sort of psychopathology that happened with parents or a history of it in the family, and then definitely lower socioeconomic status. So when I can't like wheel people in and get them in with their heart, then I go for their bank, right? I go for the checking account. So this is what I call my checking account slide. But I think that it speaks volumes, right? So the CDC in 2010 did kind of a longitudinal study um, where they looked at previous histories, um, receipts, bills, all those types of things, and kind of broke it down. So in 2012, this was published. To my knowledge, an updated one hasn't been done, but think about inflation. But when you look at it, if there's a survivor of maltreatment, trauma, that's untreated, then you're looking about $200,000, right? Between childhood health care, adult health care, um, and all the other things that go along with it. So if you think about that and you include inflation, then think about the millions of dollars Kentucky could be saving if we buffered against maltreatment and trauma. This one is huge um, and painful, I think, as well. We know that about um, five or more ACEs means that you're three times more likely to misuse prescription medication and five times more likely to engage in IV drug use. Um, more than 80% of individuals seeking treatment for opioid use disorder um, had one childhood trauma. We're going to get into that a little bit more when we talk about ACEs. This slide really speaks to their original reason that opioids were developed, right? It was to control horrible pain in human bodies. So if there was a horrific accident, um, some sort of natural disaster, cancer um, treatment, any of those types of things, um, huge surgeries, right? Like open heart surgery, you usually are prescribed opioids afterwards because the pain could be so massive. What this slide doesn't tell the story of is how the companies that were manufacturing these drugs didn't share with anybody that they were addictive and actually told their sellers, the sales reps that were going out to different doctors to lie and say that they weren't addictive. So that's the origin of the opioid crisis in America. And I just wanted to highlight that, that originally the doctors that were prescribing these drugs were told that they weren't addictive. Later on, they obviously you learn that it's a very addictive substance. So I wanted you guys to kind of have that as well if you haven't talked about it or heard it. Um, I really feel like compassion is key. So this is a non-judgmental room, right, um, for today. And I want you to think about something. So typically what I would do during this section is I would say, you know, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to remember when you were five years old. And I want you to think about laying on your bed, laying on the carpet, laying on fresh cut grass. And I want you to think about what did five or six-year-old you want to be? What kind of goals did you have in life? And then I'll pull the audience and they'll kind of share with me. And then I'll geek out with you guys and I'll tell you that I really wanted to be Sarah in the labyrinth and dance with David Bowie at the ball. Like that was my dream. That's what I wanted to do. Sadly, you guys must know by now um, that didn't work out for me. <clears throat> he married him on and that's okay. Um, and then we'll all chuckle a little bit, right? And then I'll pull the audience again and I'll say, please raise your hand high. If five or six year old you thought that you would be a two pack a day smoker, and you know, nobody will raise their hand in the audience. And then I say, what about, um, you know, $100 a day um, but Coke addiction? Nobody will raise their hand. And I just keep going on and on and on. And then what I finally say is, that's exactly it. That's what we need to remember on a daily basis is that substance misuse disorder is not something that anybody ever dreams of. It's the stuff of nightmares. When you're unable to cope 
with the traumatic experiences you've had, or you're unable to cope with something that's currently going on in your, your life that's a stressor, you turn to drugs to medicate. So we really want to give people grace and we want to understand that. We want to wrap our arms around them and support them and give them everything that they need in their recovery and let them know that they're safe because we understand what's heard. Um, the other thing I want to talk with you all about is that substance use disorders um, rate and risk actually increases for trauma because of the situation and the lifestyle. So I don't know about you all, but I have never had someone come to me and be like, well, Crystal, I bought XYZ substance at this five-star hotel. Now, maybe the cartel does that. Maybe there's, you know, exchanges with the cartel that happen in five-star hotels, but most individuals, when they're seeking substances, are going to have to go um, to a lower socioeconomic status environment where there may be a higher risk of crime, or they're going to a 40-acre farm, right, in the middle of nowhere where no one's going to be around. Either way, that's really dangerous. Then you think about sex trafficking. Um, you know, when we have no money or currency to use, we'll use our bodies, right, to get what we need. And so that puts you at risk um, for all types of things. But even sometimes when that occurs and rape happens, the substance is still not given to you. Um, and then uh, intravenous drug use with different substances. We, you know, there's HIV, there's HEP, A, B, and C. Um, there's a risk of blood clots. So there are so many things that we need to think about that can occur tra traumatically to individuals who have substance misuse disorders. That's why needle exchange programs are so important, um, not only to help keep everybody safe public health wise, but also that's often the time where people will meet somebody after they've been there the seventh, eighth, ninth time that really can speak to them and be like, hey, I've been here too. Peer support specialists, if any of you are watching, I send you a lot of love, hugs and respect what you do is amazing and I appreciate you so much um, because you're the ones at the you know needle exchange programs that really can help someone because you know where they've been and you're a survivor and you empower them just by your survival. So thank you so much for all that you do. Okay, I'm gonna talk with you all about ACEs. I'm actually gonna play a video for you first. And John, if you wouldn't mind to let me know, just give me a thumbs up if the video comes out okay when I start to play the video, because um, I can actually see you. Um, the other thing is, if you have never heard about adverse childhood experiences previously, um, this can hit people pretty hard. So we'll take a moment to kind of process after it's over, but trauma trigger warning. And also if you need to get up away from your computer or walk around, you go right ahead and do that. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. Can you guys hear it now? John, I've lost my ability to see What does it. your parents' yeah, divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development, as well as the immune system, increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up.
Anda and Felitti tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle class and college educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. Okay, is everybody doing all right after that? Give a thumbs up if your camera's on. And uh, John and Chris, can you let me know if everybody's doing a thumbs up or they look okay? So if that's the first time that you've heard about this, um, it can hit you in a lot of different ways, but there are a couple of things I wanna talk about. You can have all 10 of adverse childhood experiences and have had one protective caregiver <clears throat> and it won't affect you in the same way as an individual who only, who's only had three or four ACEs but didn't have that protective caregiver. So I wanna point that out. The other thing I wanna point out is what Dr. Anda said, what's predictable is preventable, right? So we need to find a way as a community, as a commonwealth, um, to make sure that this isn't happening to kiddos. And if it is, how do we mitigate it? How do we get in front of it? How do we buffer for these children? The third thing I wanna say is that um, we're gonna talk about in a little bit how it actually affects adult health. So even though they gave schools an example, right? That people are becoming trauma-informed schools because of adverse childhood experiences. That's what we also need in our court system, our judicial system. And then know that the judges and lawyers are working very diligently to learn more about trauma-informed care and ACEs, but it's really important. And then the fourth thing to kind of make a chuckle if I can, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, she was the African-American woman you saw who was in the clinic. Um, I wanted to be her when I grew up. Um, she has an awesome TED talk um, about adverse childhood experiences, and she has actually created a clinic near Kaiser Permanente, where the research first came out, um, that is really a true system of care, meaning mental health, physical health, um, all different types of, of care, resources for families, and I feel like that's what we need. 
So those are the things I kind of want you guys to hold on to as we move forward. Um, just want to talk about two to three children and youth were exposed to violence in the past year. So, or I'm sorry, two out of three. Um, prevalence of childhood trauma. So this graph kind of breaks it down nicely. This is some of the newer research. Um, one in five adults report three or more adverse um, experiences. And you guys can certainly look that over more in detail when you get the slides. Here's how the adverse childhood experiences were broken down into 10 gap categories. So there's abuse and neglect, emotional and physical, and sexual. And then there's um, interpersonal or domestic violence, substance misuse, um, parental separation or divorce, mental illness in a household or a member of the household incarcerated. What I wanna point out that's really important is that substance misuse and mental health, that's untreated, that is not treated. Um, so I feel like that's really important for individuals to know. The other thing that I think is really important that I wanna point out to all of you is there is now what they call an 11th ACE. The CDC has adopted this and it's poverty or lower uh, socioeconomic status, which I think we all knew um, anecdotally and just in living life, but now it's actually talked about. Um, the studies were originally done in cities. So they looked at the um, population how high the population was and how low the resources for that population were because the population is so high. I think that this is actually applicable to Kentucky as well. When you think about our topography um, and people, how far they have to travel for services, especially if we're looking at Southeastern Kentucky, Southwestern Kentucky, um, you know, with the flooding that's recently happened. But even before all of that, um, just to get to like, the town that's closest to yours that would have services may be only a 20 mile commute, but because of valleys, knobs, um, mountains, whatever the case is, a river, it actually takes you an hour or an hour and a half. Um, so that's something to really think about. And then you mix in lower socioeconomic status. And when you have to choose whether or not you're gonna feed your children at the dinner table or go to a therapy appointment, that's a pretty clear choice, right? So I wanted to point that out. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is people who have four or more ACEs make up 65% of people who misuse alcohol, misuse drugs, or utilize um, intravenous drugs. That's 78%. So think about if we could mitigate or reduce adverse childhood experiences. It would be huge, it'd be huge. The last um, thing that I wanna point out data-wise with the adverse childhood experiences is this. So if you look at this graph, red numbers are US data nationwide, black numbers, so you've got red at the top and then black at the bottom. Um, so for the first one, zero, 36.4 is national average, 40.7 is Kentucky's average. That's great. When you look at zero to uh, three aces, Kentucky is actually lower than average. That means that less of our population has zero to three ACEs. What's concerning for me is that once you get to four and up, we, by the time you get to six, we've doubled the national average. With the adverse childhood experiences, the more ACEs that you're exposed to, the more likely that you could have chronic diseases like they showed in the video, right? So the more ACEs you have, um, it can really affect and impact your life. And remember the video said that six or more ACEs can take 20 years off of your life. That's two solid decades, that's huge. The other thing that I wanna point out uh, about the ACEs is that it does not account for all types of trauma that can occur in early childhood or as an adult. So obviously increased dosage of trauma, the chronicity um, of the trauma, those add together to increase the likelihood of post-traumatic stress disorder, certainly complex trauma or any other mental health issues. So um, before I move on to the brain section, I just wanna say this, um, and this will be the slide that I'm actually gonna read word for word to you guys because it's so important. There is a stronger link between childhood trauma and substance misuse than there is between obesity and diabetes. 
two thirds of individuals who struggle with substance misuse disorders report being abused as children. That means that the war on drugs is a war on traumatized people that just need help. So how does trauma affect our brains? I'm gonna play um, a little video for you. Sound still good? Yes. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. Okay, so what I would like for you all to keep in mind about that particular um, video is that the pruning that happens when children are exposed to toxic stress, complex trauma, there's a hormone that's released into our system. It's called cortisol. And that cortisol will break those neurological synapses. Um, and so actually cortisol is toxic to the brain. We're gonna talk about that a little bit um, in a little bit when we talk about fight, flight, or freeze. But what happens for these children is an inverted, um, I'm sorry, uh, most kids, typical development, you don't have to worry about your survival much, right? So we're allowed to think about regulation, social, emotional things, cognition. For children who spend the majority of their youth, so birth to six, worrying if they're gonna be fed, worrying if they're gonna be safe, survival becomes the main basis. So it's like my, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. How can we ever actualize and get all the way to the top of um, you know, introspection and insight if we're constantly worried about our safety. If I had to take one slide and tell you that it summarizes the reason behind everything that I do professionally and personally, this slide would be it. So um, this um, on the left side is what we would consider um, normal, typical development, whatever that is, a six-year-old. On the right side of um, the slide is actually a Romanian orphan. So I want to remind you guys, most of the time, most of the time in these orphanages, um, there wasn't sexual or physical abuse per se, but there was maltreatment in the form of neglect. So um, children's cribs were lined up right across the room. The only place there wouldn't be a crib is where the entrance was. They were prop bottle fed. Um, they certainly were clothed, bathed, diapers changed, but it was done on a routine schedule. So it wasn't done when the child was picked up, coddled, and loved on. And so when I told you guys earlier that, you know, ADHD, um, bipolar disorder, um, borderline personality, all of those diagnoses, it could actually be because of trauma. Um, if we don't do a good thorough trauma, trauma history, um, psychosocial intake, because if you look at the brain on the right, you'll see the frontal cortex right here. It's two holes, almost 
that are missing, right? So when you see the brighter, um, most like the red, that's where the brain is most active in an individual. So for the one on the left, the frontal cortex is really engaged. That's good. Our frontal cortex is our executive functioner, right? It gives us the ability to control ourselves, make moral judgments, um, judgments in general. So for instance, it's the reason why, even though your speaker is from New Jersey, she wouldn't have any profanity, right? In the presentation, because my frontal cortex is like, don't you do it, Crystal. But for children who have experienced maltreatment or complex trauma, they're literally missing the connection because of that toxic stress and the cortisol that's been toxic to their brain and broken those synapses. So um, you'll see little activity in the frontal cortex, but if you look in comparison back here where we have our reptilian brains, so to speak, that does fight, flight, or freeze response, as well as basic things like sleep-wake cycle um, and also breathing, um, it's more activated. So these children are more in fight, flight, or freeze mode because of that active amygdala, right? Um, and so these kids are going to look like they're not able to focus, that they're hyperactive, but it's actually due to maltreatment. I kind of also think about it this way. If um, our brains build kind of like the foundation in a house, so you've got your foundation or basement, first floor, maybe a second floor, and an addict. If I, the addict is where our executive functioning is, these kiddos are missing the steps to get from the basement to the first floor or the first floor to the second. And so when they've had multiple traumatic events over long periods of time, and that's like the complex trauma, we can't ask a child that's been through that or in later years, and we see them in the judicial system, you can't expect them to act and behave in the same way that an individual that wasn't exposed to it because they're missing some foundational steps needed. Um, I want to point this out really quickly, but I feel like it's really powerful. Um, and as a very young clinician, I wish that I had known this information then, like I know it now. So we've got the, um, uh, the nervous system, right? Sympathetic, parasympathetic. So accelerator, fight, flight, or freeze, or fight or flight, I mean, and then the parasympathetic, that kind of acts like a the breaks and there's a balance. There's a window of tolerance that every individual can handle. Here's why I bring this up. For um, those of you who are survivors of severe um, physical or sexual abuse, um, or if you're a first responder that's ever frozen, I want you to know that it is legitimately not your fault. So what happens to us when we get a stimulant that scares us and we fear for our lives, our brain chooses whether we stay in fight, whether we fly or whether we freeze. So for instance, if a bear were to come in to my room right now, I would either fight it, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I try and run from it, but my door is right here. So I'm pretty much stuck. My body's gonna freeze. I'm gonna freeze, I'm gonna shut down. And I want survivors to know that that is their body trying to protect them, that they had no control over it. Um, also, if you know a survivor that has frozen, share this information with them. It's so important to get it out and for people to be educated about it. Okay, guys, I'm gonna go into um, a trauma-informed care and um, what a true system of care should look like. Are there any questions about that slide? or those sets of slides on neurodevelopment. Okay, so let's talk about a true system of care approach. Um, certainly, when we look at a system of care, people have to feel culturally safe, but in order for us to achieve that, we have to make sure that they feel physically and psychologically safe. And that's where the trauma-informed care comes in. So trauma-informed care actually is a continuum. So it's a spectrum, like anything else. We go from trauma awareness to actual trauma-informed. Trauma awareness is when maybe you've learned about the ACEs, you get the prevalence of trauma. So for instance, 64% um, in the nation have had one or more ACEs. Here in Kentucky, 64% of our population has had two or more ACEs. So you're kind of aware of that. And you're like, 
hmm, maybe that impacts the people that I serve. Trauma sensitive is starting to explore the principles of trauma informed care. Um, trauma responsive means that there's a cultural shift going on. Trauma informed is when trauma informed practices are, happen across the board at every level of every organization. I want to talk a bit about resiliency too. I feel like it's so important. Um, it's really important for people who struggle with substance misuse disorder to know that they're resilient and that they can recover. And so, um, you know, the first time that I saw the slide with the Romanian orphan, it haunted me my whole drive home. Um, and still, occasionally when I'm given this presentation, it'll hit me. Um, but all of that inactivity in the frontal cortex and the overactivity in the amygdala, that can be changed. Our brains can be rewired. Research has even proven that people um, who struggle with forms of dementia can learn new tasks. So that means that our brain is continuing to grow. Those neurological synapses are continuing to connect um, and respond all the way up until the time that we pass. So we can develop resilience, not just in the children, but in adults. And so what supports resilience? Um, definitely family support. Um, and let's always think outside the box, right? It doesn't have to be your blood family. It can be the family that you've adopted for yourself. It can be the people that are your family in your heart. Um, peer support specialists. I praised you before. I'm going to praise you again. Um, we'll even do like the Taylor Swift love. I just have so much respect and appreciation for you. And I've learned so much from you over the years. So thank you. Confidence. This is huge to be able to talk with somebody about the ways in which they're confident and help them build their self schema. And it helps them build the schema of the world um, is so important. Um, self esteem, self efficacy, connectedness, and spiritual belief. And that doesn't necessarily have to be religious, um, you know, being a part of this universe, putting out good energy whatever they feel like works for them. We don't need to prescribe it for them, but just maybe open the door for them to explore it. Certainly um, engage family when appropriate or engage the people that that person has chosen as their family. This means that we've got to be flexible, right? It's no more like just immediate um, family can be present. If this person says, you know, this is my love, this is the person I consider my parent, you know, this is my go-to, my one, then that's their family. Um, offering spiritual and religious components. Um, if you have somebody who identifies as Christian and they want to pray before the session, or you have somebody who's Muslim who wants to pray before the session, allow that to happen. Um, bring it into your offices. You know, just because you're a physician um, doesn't mean that you can't bring that component in, especially if they find peace and joy and solace in it. Um, peer support specialists, again, I can't praise you all enough. Um, ways to increase their self-esteem. Um, definitely talking to people about how far you've seen them go, or even if it's just that first meeting saying, you know, I'm so proud of you for coming in today, or I'm really glad that you showed up at Needle Exchange. Um, I hope to see you again, you know, next week whatever the case is, because it's non-judgmental and that's what we all need. We need that compassion and we need that grace. Um, point out achievements and competency. So let's say that their past four um, drug screens have tested positive. Okay, but that fifth one's negative. Don't talk about the four that are positive. We all know, right? And they know better than anybody else. Talk about the one that was negative and praise the Jesus. Like, I am so proud of you. This is negative. Way to go. You can do it. Um, whatever you need to do. If you need to get them a t-shirt, that's like, we can do it. Do it for them. Um, and encourage connectedness. Um, so oftentimes with substance misuse disorder, a lot of bridges are burned. Um, and so people may really feel alone and feel isolated. Just getting them to connect with someone is a huge step. And then helping them reach out, sponsors, um, peer support specialists, um, their neighbor, 
um, you know, whatever, just get them connected because we get so much as human beings out of relationships and connection. That's why the COVID pandemic has been so difficult on people um, because of that lack of feeling really connected to others. Um, so let's talk about trauma-informed practices that are specific to substance misuse disorder. I put here some questions that could open the door for the conversation, um, but not necessarily be pressuring or um, make the person feel like they're violated, right? It's our choice when we share a trauma history and to what detail and degree we share it. So um, you could say something like, what do you want me to know about your past experiences? Um, what would be most helpful to you right now in this moment? And if they don't have an idea, offer some things up. You look cold. Do you need a blanket? Can I get you a glass of water? Would you like a cup of coffee? Or do you need your rent paid? Do we need to find resources like that for them? Um, is there anything you're struggling with or want assistance with? All of these questions are geared toward reminding them that they have choices that they're competent to choose for themselves, but also to just let them know that they're cared about as an individual, as a human being. Okay, so strength-based skill building, we really wanna have skills that support recovery and healing. So all of us need affect regulation, right? We all need grounding and coping skills. We need that mind-body connection, um, and we need to process boundaries with ourselves and with others. Um, so definitely make some of the goals to um, increase self-esteem. Planning for emergencies could absolutely be important, especially safety planning. So if you have an individual who has misused substances due to trauma, um, you definitely want to make a safety plan. Okay, what's going to happen if you get this craving? What can you do? Um, what's a grounding coping skill for you? Okay, if that doesn't work, who can you call? Can you meet up with somebody for coffee? Can you go to an AA or an NA meeting? Have things in place because all of us will be triggered. Um, even when we've healed and we've recovered from trauma, substance misuse, or both, there are still moments where you're triggered. Your brain is altered because of trauma and your brain is altered because of substance misuse. So thinking in the future, at some point, I'm going to be triggered again. What's going to be my go-to so that it just becomes automatic. I don't even need to think about it if I need it. And then certainly no one can recover from trauma or from substance misuse disorder if they're still feeling like they're not psychologically or physically safe. So that is the basic, right? It's like Maslow's hierarchy of need, food, water, shelter, safety. You have to have those things before you can do anything else in life. Um, so we certainly wanna support safety, choice and control in trauma-informed practices. Essentially, trauma-informed practices are a way of saying, hey, I know how prevalent trauma is and what are the things that I can do to make sure that when people walk through my door, they feel safe, that both physically and psychologically, and they feel like they're valued as a human being. It's very basic things, but it's a world of difference. Um, avoid re-traumatizing them. Um, so certainly, um, you know, some children that I see, some adults that I see have a thing with large windows. I have a very large window in my office. So we'll go to another office that may not have any windows at all, just the door, because that's what makes them feel safe. Um, if you have a waiting room, is there a waiting room that's just separate and private in case they need a moment or they're having a tough day? And then certainly we wanna promote healing and recovery because we know that that can happen. Language is huge, everyone. And in substance misuse disorder, it's always changing and it's evolving. And that's a good thing because we want to make sure that people feel like they're heard and that we're identifying them correctly. But this is really important with gender specific space and treatment as well. So gender diversity, transgender, women and men, we all have unique and individual needs, right? And then we all identify with a community. We are the ones that choose that community, right? So we need to talk about the way that we access services. If somebody identifies as a transgender woman, you're not gonna send them, you're not gonna send her to a male treatment facility and vice versa. 
Um, also, when we're doing intake information or when we're handing out pamphlets or brochures, we want to make sure that we have language that's inclusive, right? People who are a minority tend to be in a category that's already been traumatized, whether it be recent or historically. And so we want to make sure that we're thinking about that and we're saying you're safe here. I see who you really are here and I'm ready to support and help you in whatever way that I can. Okay, um, so trauma organizations in general, like this could be a whole three to six hour um, training in and of itself, but it's important to note that all, and I mean all staff, have to um, go through different trainings so that they can learn about it. It doesn't matter if it is your administrative assistant, the um, sanitary um, assistant, and the CEO, the director, up and up and up. It doesn't matter who it is. Everybody should be given the chance to have trauma-informed training and build their trauma-informed competency. Um, and also for policies and procedures, what does the um, de-escalation look like? What does urine screening um, look like, right? What does blood, blood drawing look like? Is it safe? Is it private? Does the person have somebody they identify as being in their own gender um, to be with them? So really a lot of things that we can think about. Control, connection, and meaning. I highlight this very specifically. What happens when we've been traumatized? We feel like we've lost our control. We feel like we've lost our connection. We feel like we've lost our meaning. All those things feel like they're taken from us. So to heal trauma-informed care, make sure that we, have, we give them control back. And that can be as simple as just making choices, right? Do you know? Do you want to do um, your urine screen at the beginning of the meeting, or would you rather do it at the end? Um, connection, giving of yourself, sharing with them, um, giving of your time and your attention—that's huge. Time is the only thing that we can't buy more of, right? And so, to give it away is actually a huge currency. Um, and people who receive our time appreciate it; they feel that. Um, and then they get to decide on their journey, right? They get to decide on the meaning of what's occurred to them. We don't get to label that for them. That's all for them. So um, I put that um, the yes, no in here kind of to lighten things up a little bit, but also because it's really important. Things you don't want to do. You don't want to say that you're a trauma-informed organization or agency and look at people's um, challenges and weaknesses only say, this is the way it is, have a cookie cutter approach, um, you know, the suck it up buttercup, you're gonna do the 12 steps. You can do the 12 steps, if, but it doesn't have to be so manualized, right? It can be creative, um, you know, it can help people, it can bring them out of the depths of despair. So also a fixed mindset, we're doing too. We need to do with, right? We're doing this in collaboration. Recovery happens in collaboration with connection not because somebody's being told to do something, that it's not how recovery works for anyone. So all the yes things are all the things that we want to include in our organization and we want to ex um, exemplify as individuals, right, who are practicing and providing. Okay, so just like we talked about um, when we talked about the continuum for trauma-informed care, you kind of have to take stock as to where you guys feel like KY Open is right now. Um, I would find a champion for trauma-informed care for KY Open, and then I'd also try and seek one out in your local community, and then have some follow-up discussions. Trauma-informed care can't just be one individual in an organization trying to do it. It needs to come from the top down and the bottom up, meaning that there's constant communication going on. We actually, um, the Center for um, Trauma and Children actually has um, a secondary traumatic stress, um, which we're going to talk about in a second, um, survey that you can take to kind of figure out where your organization is. So do you need a needs assessment, which is what that is? Um, do you feel like you need further training? Um, what kind of changes are going to be made to policies and procedures in light of trauma-informed practices? So those are all the things that you want to think of. Um, the second to last thing that I want to share with you that I feel like is so extraordinarily important and nobody talks about it, right? 
Um, especially a lot of people don't talk about it until they're out in the field. This isn't something that we have a lot of graduate work around or post-doc work around or we hear about in high school, although we should. Anybody who is a healer or a first responder or a caregiver can certainly go um, and experience secondary traumatic stress. Same signs and symptoms as post-traumatic stress disorder. It's just not, it's not diagnosed as post-traumatic stress disorder. So certainly we need to recognize that it's an occupational hazard. We need to reach out to each other and be educating on this. Um, but to combat secondary traumatic stress, we have to have compassion, satisfaction in our job, and we also have to feel psychologically and physically safe as providers. So, you know, self-care is important. We need to do that for ourselves. That helps to mitigate and um, buffer against secondary traumatic stress. But we also need organizations at the higher up level to support us in that, to say, yeah, I'm taking a mental health day and it'd be okay without any judgment or fear. So um, secondary traumatic stress certainly could be a much longer workshop. If you guys are interested in that, please reach out and let me know. Happy to provide that for you if you've enjoyed this presentation. And then the very last thing that I'll ask of you, and I can't see you guys, so I'm going on the honor system, right? The buddy system. I want you to take out your cell phone. I don't want you to take a picture of this because if you need this, you're not going to want to roll, right? You're not going to want to do the scroll roll. It is not going to be helpful. You're going to want to actually put this number into your cell phone. So this is the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And look, guys, even the number of times I've done this presentation, did you see my eyes dart down really fast to make sure I knew the number? So 1-800-273-TALK, which is 8255. So 1-800-273-8255. Um, because when we need this number, whether it's for ourselves, a loved one, somebody that we're working with, a colleague, um, a peer, it doesn't matter. You're not gonna really be thinking straight to roll through your photos, right? You're gonna need to have it right away so that you can call or so you can give it to the other person. And this can save lives, truly. I know that 988 has launched now. I'll be honest, I would use this for at least another month or two. Um, I'm sure that there are some kinks that need to be worked out, but if you do wanna promote, promote 988, Go ahead and do that, but I would always give this as a backup just in case. So these are resources. You guys can look those over at another time. This is my contact information. I want to leave that up for just a second. Um, in this COVID-esque, post-COVID, I'm not sure where we are really with COVID right now, but um, it's easiest to reach me by email. But you're certainly welcome to call me um, and leave me a voicemail message. My voicemail is protected, um, so nobody else has access to it except for myself. Um, and so you can contact me either of those ways. And then also check out all the stuff that the Center on Trauma and Children do. Um, it has you know, been a really huge, important goal for me to get to the center. Um, it was one of my professional goals. Um, and even that I'm here, I still can't not brag on them enough. Um, they're just a phenomenal group of individuals. Um, and everybody who works here's heart is in the work and they're willing to help. So check out all the awesome things that are going on.